I didn't really find out how truly lucky I was until just a year or two ago. I went to a national meningitis conference for the first time ever. I was in the room with 50 other meningitis survivors and saw just exactly what the disease can do to you. And you felt so lucky. Yeah, I, I felt amazingly blessed. Welcome to Hope to Recharge podcast. Thank you for joining me here again today. Every week we meet here to break the stigma around mental health and to bring you insight and inspiration and lots of practical tips from personal stories or professionals around the world that share how they turn their journey of mental health into healing or to thriving. Together we will break the stigma one story at a time. And mental health together is always better. Thank you for joining me here today. I'm your host, Matana. Let's get started. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp.com, the leading online platform for therapy. You can access thousands of therapists one click away. Go check out BetterHelp.com forward slash hope to recharge. Get 10% off your first month. Start your wellness now. Before we jump into today's episode, I would like to introduce to you a new package that I have out there for listeners that want to change something in their life. They might feel stuck, they might feel not inspired or a lack of motivation, and they know that where they are now is just not good enough and they want a little bit more. They're not sure what it is. They might be in a fog, they might be in a lack of inspiration, or they just need some clarity. This package is eight one-on-one sessions with me and I'm going to gift you in these sessions a specific custom-made program for you and your life and anything that's going on in your life using the tools that I incorporated in my healing and my journey that I incorporate every single day in my life with challenges. We're going to talk about gratitude, we're going to talk about acceptance, radical acceptance, forgiveness, and what it means to live in a positive mindset. If you want to hear more about this program, Program, go to my website, hope to recharge.com. You'll see link in the show notes. It's called Gift of Light. Don't miss out. It's limited time just for the holiday season now. I'm gifting a few of these away. So go check it out and see if this is something you want to gift yourself. Hey there, thank you for joining me here for another inspiring story. It is the month of December. We decided that we're going to wrap up 2020 strong. And in the month of December, we are discussing resilience. If you haven't listened to my solo episode, go back and listen to it. In today's episode, we are going to be discussing powerful lifestyle of resilience from Brian Reynolds. He is a world-renowned record-holding runner, a double below-the-knee amputee. He lost his legs when he was a little child. He runs every single day. Talk about resilience. He inspired me. I follow him for years because his attitude is always of gratefulness and moving forward. Never do I hear or see him say anything about poor me. He doesn't look at himself as a victim. He looks at himself as a thriver and he inspires everyone around them to work with what they have and make the best they can and push forward. Resilience. He never dwells in his sadness and how how unfortunate it is that he doesn't have his legs. He sees the blessings in his life and what he can achieve with what he has. I hope you enjoy this episode. You will take a lot out of it. After you listen, please do us a favor. Subscribe to us on iTunes if you didn't and leave us a review. The biggest way that you can show us gratitude is by going to iTunes and leaving us a review and forwarding it to somebody that it can help them in their journey of life. Inspire them. Thank you for being a part of our community. Enjoy this listen. You were born with your legs, is that correct? Yes, I was born with them. Uh, I was born with an autoimmune disorder, which my wife will probably correct me, but I think it's called hypogamma globulemia, which is basically I was like the bubble boy. So I had no real immune system. So I was sick with everything when I was growing up, which my poor mother having to deal with that, I can't even imagine. Mm. And at the age of four, it culminated with me contracting a rare form of meningitis called meningococcemia, Mm. which is the blood-based version of meningitis. The most common phrase associated with it is healthy at breakfast and dead by dinner. That's literally how fast the onset is if you don't catch it. Um, Because I had grown up being so sick all the time, when I woke up that morning, it was, I think, February of 
1992, I think. I was a little bit sick, but I was always sick, so my parents didn't really think too much else. There was no serious fever. My throat was a little bit sore. So they sent me to preschool. You know, half day preschool, I came home and I was feeling not good at all. My fever was much higher. One of the more common symptoms of meningococcemia is purple rashes. I had a purple rash that was all the way across my chest. And that's when my parents knew that something wasn't right and rushed me to the hospital. Hmm. We got lucky that there happened to be a pediatrician on staff right there that was researching meningitis and knew what to do. Um, Because even now, but especially in 1992, the fatality rate was extremely high. It was like 90th percentile Hmm. fatality rate. Hmm. Medicines that they put you on to kind of stop you from dying are called vasopressors. Mm -hmm. And it basically shunts all the blood in your body back to your core, your main organs. So that's actually what causes the destruction of your limbs. Mm. So as far as meningitis patients go, I am extremely fortunate. I only lost two legs. Most of them are affected in all four limbs. Mm. And they often have extreme scarring throughout the body. Almost looks like um, they were a victim of a shark attack like Hmm. just jagged chunks taken out of their skin. Many suffer from cognitive impairment as well. So I would say on the whole, I'm an extremely lucky person to come out of it with just a double leg amputation. Let me process that. You're saying that you're lucky that you only lost two legs. Exactly. We don't really hear those words very often. I'm just having a hard time understanding how somebody can be so grateful that they lost only two legs and not other limbs versus saying, I can't believe whether other people lose it, lose more or less. It's still really challenging to lead life without legs. I would say the the second bit of luck for me is that it happened when I was younger. Meningitis. So the meningitis vaccine isn't even indicated for young children. So even if the vaccine was around in 1992, Mm -hmm. um, which it wasn't, it wouldn't have been recommended until you're an adolescent because that's when it's most common is adolescence through college. It's one of those vaccines that you need before you go off to college. So the fact that I was only four, I've had a lot of time to adapt. Children are are much easier at adapting to difficult situations in life than if it happened later in life for me. I didn't really find out how truly lucky I was until just a year or two ago. I went to a national meningitis conference. For the first time ever, I was in the room with 50 other meningitis survivors and saw just exactly what the disease can do to you. And you felt so lucky. Yeah, I, I felt amazingly blessed. It was a very humbling experience that weekend at that conference. Interesting. You're a rare case of children getting meningitis, this form of meningitis. It's not, it's not unheard of, but it's more rare. And the fact that your parents caught it was like a miracle. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here talking to me. Exactly. I, extremely lucky, especially in 1992. You know, they weren't quite, quite as uh, well-versed in understanding the signs and symptoms because it looks exactly like the flu. Are you an only child? Nope. I have a younger brother and a younger sister. At the time, were you the only child? My sister is three years younger than me. So she was alive. And when she was born at 16 days old, she had open heart surgery for transposition of the great vessels of the heart. So she was only a few months out of surgery when I got sick. Wow. Maybe about a year out of surgery when I got sick. And my brother was born when I was in the hospital getting my legs amputated. Yeah, so I don't even know how my parents did it. You know, having two kids myself, I I just can't. It's mind-blowing to me that they managed to get through it all. And that they even noticed the rash that you're talking about. There's so much going on. It's amazing. My mom was like 35 or 36 weeks pregnant at that point. So Wow, 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 wow. Your mother must be amazing. Is she still alive? Yeah. She I, is, want, uh... I want to speak to her one day and get some <laughs> tips of, on motherhood because she sounds incredible. Yeah, she's quite an incredible person. <laughs> so walk me through that day. You're four years old. You're so little. I can't even, I'm trying to think, a four-year-old that's, that's two years older than my son now that's just starting to speak. So you really don't have a real understanding of life. Mm-hmm. You're just yeah, starting I... to play and making friends and everything is very new to you. Every little thing is exciting. And then you're not feeling well. You get to the hospital. They tell you that you have this meningitis. And right away, they tell you that you need to 
to amputate your legs? I was four, so my memory is probably a little bit blurry or skewed on it. But I do remember going to school that day. And I remember coming home from school and I was sitting on my dad's lap drinking a glass of orange juice when they took my temperature. But I don't really remember going to the hospital or anything after that. My my fever was extremely high, so I was put in a medically induced coma. I don't know how soon that was. I don't know if it was that night or the next day. But I was in a medically induced coma for a few weeks. For a few weeks? Yeah. Wow. They were working on medications and everything else, just trying to keep me alive. Wow. The medical history, as far as what my parents remember, is a little bit skewed, too, because they were dealing with my sister, with my mom just about to have a baby. Mm. So the lines are a bit blurred. One of my most vivid recollections of the hospital is, like, the day I woke up. Mm -hmm. which my legs had been amputated at that point. I don't know what the time frame was. I don't know if it was two weeks or four weeks, but it was a few weeks. They had actually made casts that resembled the shape of my legs so that I wouldn't be startled Mm. when I woke up. But I knew immediately that there was a problem. That was the first thing I asked. (laughs) Oh, right away? You couldn't That was the very first thing I asked, yeah. I said, what's wrong with my legs? As a four-year-old, you knew that. As a parent myself, now I can't even imagine having to explain that to my kids. And have that conversation with a child. Your mother must be incredible. Your parents must be incredible human beings that they were able to go through this. And your mother, uh, right before giving birth, my brain isn't processing everything you're telling me because as a parent, my heart is actually an aching now, like literally in pain hearing this Mm -hmm. story. And to see you sitting here and you're a grown up and so alive and well is encouraging me to get over this pain and helping me understand this. So you're four, you're probably in tremendous amount of pain. You have to learn everything about life again, like how to be a child again. You have to learn everything from scratch. Walk me through that. If you can, I don't know if you remember as a child, was there bullying? Was there fear? Will I have friends? Will I not have friends? Or were you too young to even care about that? I don't remember, I would say, most of the bad things in the hospital. I don't know if that's just a childhood brain kind of uh, blocking it out. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember all the fun times in the hospital. I remember my family visiting me. I I had a single occupation room and every single wall in the ceiling was covered with cards from Mm -hmm. people, friends and relatives and whoever else had sent in like favorite stuffed animals. So I remember that stuff. I remember Barney walking around the hospital floor and coming in and singing songs. I remember baking cake. My aunt and uncle smuggling in a fish tank for me. (laughs) (laughs) I think I remember a lot more of the good times than I do any of the bad times. I don't even really remember walking for the first time, to be honest with you. How long were you in the hospital for after this? That's another thing. uh, The lines are rather blurred. I think I got out at like the end of April or the beginning of May. So a good few months. Yeah, I I was in there somewhere like eight to 10 weeks. Do you know why they kept you so long? Was it to teach you how to walk with prosthetics? I I honestly don't know the exact reasons. I know that I know that amputations in general then took longer to heal from than they do now. Mm-hmm. You don't usually get fitted with prosthetics until about 10 to 12 weeks after surgery. So I definitely went home without any prosthetics on. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember going home and being wheeled up onto the front porch with um, with a wheelchair. Do you remember having a conversation with your parents? Like, what do I do now when I need something? When I need to go to the bathroom? If I want to drink? Like, what happens? No, I, I, I don't really remember anything like that. I, I think I hit the ground running. I, I taught myself how to climb on counters. I taught myself how to climb in and out of bed. I, think I, caused, I think I caused more issues than anything else. <laughs> Wow. So you had courage from very young. I think I like finding ways around obstacles. You never felt like a victim. No, I don't think it's something that a four-year-old mind can even process. Mm -hmm. I I wouldn't say throughout my entire life that I haven't said, why me? Everybody Mm -hmm. has those moments in life over whatever obstacle is in their path. Mm -hmm. But just like anybody else, I, I do my best to work around those obstacles. And I think my obstacles are just different. Than the average, than anybody else. They're not necessarily more. They're just different. They're, they're maybe they're visible obstacles. I have to figure out physical ways to get around things. Mm-hmm. But everybody has their own obstacles and difficulties in life that they have to figure out how to get around, whether it's physical or mental right. or anything else. Do you remember the first time as a child that you were having a hard time with it, or do you you never really had a hard time with losing your legs? 
you just accepted it from the beginning and you said, I'm going to just make do with whatever I get and I'm going to get through life. I don't really remember any of the early days. I don't even remember walking with prosthetics for the first time. The first time I felt different, I think I was like six and a half, seven in that time frame. I was, I was out of pool swimming. I noticed kids talking about me. That was the first time I felt different. It was a few years later. That one little comment from a kid prompted me to put on pants and never take them off. Really? Um, until I was about, it was after college, it was like 22, 23 was the first time I wore shorts again. Really? Yeah. What an impact. But your friends knew that you were wearing yeah, prosthetics. Yeah, I, I went to a small um, private school in Massachusetts and everybody that was with me in kindergarten also went through eighth grade with me. Mm-hmm. Well, I went to an all boy high school. So a lot of the boys then went on to high school. With, I was fairly well insulated with my small group of people that knew me from eight four it wasn't real bullying it was like curiosity like kids say things because they're curious not because they're mean it probably wasn't meant as a mean thing but you know i was six and a half or seven and right different at different at the the local family pool or whatever and that was the first experience i remember having of not wanting to be different so when did you decide to become a runner when did that happen in your life that was a lot more recent that was post-college i was always active growing up i did you know the town baseball league the town basketball league I was very good at horseback riding I did that for 12 to 14 years hmm. in college I took up powerlifting so I was bench press and deadlift basically I spent most of the beginning part of my life up until my 20s you know trying my best not to have to walk around too much or right bother right. with running right and it wasn't until I was out of college I was getting my EMT certification mm-hmm. I stumbled across a brochure for a team and training which is like an endurance team that works alongside the Leukemia and Lymphoma mm-hmm. Society. So you raise money for them and do an event, whether it's a bike ride or a run or a hike. There was a bunch of people that were getting ready to train for a hike in the Grand Canyon. And I was like, that sounds pretty cool, but you know, I can't walk like more than a quarter mile. <laughs> Right. So that was kind of my entrance into endurance sports. I trained with them for like three months and we went, this was in 2011 and we went and hiked the Grand Canyon at the end of it, which was a pretty awesome experience, Hmm. both just from a physical perspective, but most especially it was amazing to be able to raise money for such an awesome organization. And that was kind of my gateway into, you know, maybe I can do more than just uh, be a gym rat. I can hike for long distances. Why can't that translate to running with process? Prosthetics in general, it's hard to get a running prosthetic because insurance doesn't cover it. Mm -hmm. And they're, aside from microprocessor robotics type components that they put in legs, it's pretty much the most expensive type of prosthetic that you can get. My prosthetist quotes them at about $30,000 a piece. Wow. And insurance does not cover that. Wow. It's extremely difficult to get running prosthetics. How often do you change prosthetics? Like, is it something like you have to upgrade like shoes or is it something that stays with you for a very long time? No, I upgrade them about every 10 months. Oh, wow. More than shoes then. Yeah, well, I guess it depends on how much you're using the shoes, but I upgrade all of the prosthetics about every 10 months and they have to be the bottom of them that has a rubber tread on them for running on the road. Mm -hmm. That's about once a month. Those have to be changed out. So you really need to be super driven in order to invest into this career of running, this passion of running. To see if I was interested enough in running, I spent the first year or so running on just regular walking legs. Mm -hmm. It's extremely uncomfortable. They're not meant for it. It'd basically be like if you tried to go for a run in your ski boots. Yeah. Completely not the right thing to do. I spent the first year with my legs split open from the chafing. At points in time, you could see the bone. Wow. I was just sitting there kind of like butterfly stitching my legs back together by myself or using uh, crazy glue. (laughs) Wow. So I did that for a year before I decided that, you know, I really do like running. Right. Like if I could do this for a year, having a comfortable running prosthetics would make it really enjoyable. That was right around the time frame when I moved to New Jersey. I met a new prosthetist who was willing to help out and make an investment in me. And that's really what uh, jumpstarted my running career. Did she donate them? Yeah. I'm one of their sponsored athletes now. That's amazing. That's beautiful. What a beautiful end of the story that you found somebody to to sponsor it, but you're basically giving to them because you are the face of their company when you run. I've been lucky to find an amazing company. Um, Not every prosthetist 
has the experience to build a, a running prosthetic because there's mm -hmm. not as many active amputees. So I was lucky to stumble across a prosthetist that has vast amounts of knowledge as far as athletic and sporting prosthetics go. So it was really that combination of their ability to make an amazing quality product with my drive. Mm -hmm. Kind of the two merged together was absolutely amazing for me. Did you do this all on your own or did you have a coach teach you how to run with prosthetics? Nope. My first day there, they basically put me up on the running blades and just said, what can you do? And I was able to run really well. So really, maybe it's just the years of practice I had on prosthetics beforehand, but it kind of felt natural to me. I would say one of the more natural things I've done in my life. Do you think you would be a huge athlete if you had your legs like even early on that running is part of who you are inside and you just discovered it so much later just because you were afraid to try it out and you were afraid of the stigma of showing your legs or running or maybe the cost? That's a multi-part question. So I'll take it one step at a time. Yeah. Me and my wife have this debate all the time as to whether I would be this driven athletically if I did have legs. From my family. My family is extremely athletic, so I definitely have the athletic genes from them, but I have no idea if I would have the same sort of drive to, I don't know if I feel like a drive to prove myself to other people. It's more of a mental drive to see how far I can push myself. From a component perspective, I would say the cost of getting these prosthetics is so prohibitive. Now there's a lot of grants and charities that help out with this kind of thing. There's the Challenge Athletes Foundation and Wiggle Your Toes and the Adrian Strong Foundation. They're all great charities that help help people with this. But, you know, back when I was a teenager, just it wasn't as widely publicized. Mm -hmm. It was before social media, really. So I didn't even know that these things were available, even if I could have gotten them. Mm -hmm. I would say that I stuck with more static type of activity, such as horseback riding or, you know, baseball, there's not too much running. It's not small, quick stuff. So I stuck with that stuff, I would say, because I didn't even know the componentry existed. <laughs> before I go into your career of your successes and all of your big medals, the, and awards that you won, which is mind boggling. I want to go back a little bit to before running. Did you ever have fears that you will be different? No one's going to want to go with me to the prom. Will I get married? Will I have children? Will I be able to be a dad? Did you have those worries in your head or you were so positive and so motivated? You just said, I'm going to get through life just like anybody else. I might not have legs, but that's okay. I would say that those doubts exist in all teenage minds in general. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely, through my teenage years, felt more out of place. Even into college, I felt more out of place than most people do. I was basically letting my disability define me. I was letting it cage me in. It was definitely affecting my personality, my outlook on life. Even in high school, you know, I got, I got myself a doctor's note so that I didn't have to do gym class because I didn't want to be not as good at things as the other guys in school. And maybe there wasn't as much uh, out there for my parents to look at. I almost wish my parents didn't let me have the easy way out. I, I wish that they made me go to that gym class and do whatever I could. You know, it's no fault on them. I'm not blaming them or anything. But in but, a way, you can look at it the other way. If they would push you, maybe you wouldn't push yourself now. And you would be... Exactly. You know, Maybe the fact that they let you be and just evolve on your speed. How can someone push someone when they're not literally in their shoes? How can we people with limbs that come to somebody that doesn't and even judge them a little bit at what they're willing to show up or not show up? So maybe that was the mindset of your parents. Like the fact that he's even going to school, we're grateful. The fact that he really is willing to show up, whatever he is, that's incredible. And maybe because they gave you that space, you were able to find the clarity of what you wanted to become and not be resentful and who knows what pain you would go through then. Yeah, I, I definitely let myself be consumed with my worries about my legs, most especially when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. So who knows, it, it, it could have gone either way, I guess. It, it wasn't until I hit college that I you have to emerge from your shell a little bit in dormitories and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But even so, I was still pretty closed off. I still never wore shorts. It was just my immediate friends that knew I was an BT. It wasn't until probably close to a year after college, I was at the gym and it was a very, very old gym. So they didn't have air conditioning or anything. It was probably like over 90 degrees in there. It was over the summer and I just said, screw it. I need to wear shorts. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm dying. I walked into the gym and wore shorts and nobody even looked twice at me. That was when I finally realized nobody gives a damn what I look like. It was my own mentality that was holding me back. And mm -hmm. I literally threw away all my pants after that day. It was probably such a, an expression it was, of freedom. 
beyond wearing running legs for the first time, it was one of those most defining moments of freedom in my life. <laughs> wow. How important is that? We make obstacles in our mind that don't even mm-hmm. exist there from our fears. And we're telling ourselves stories that don't really exist because we're afraid to try something new because we're afraid of being hurt. But that hurt when you were little was probably something that took you all through life and said, mm-hmm. I don't want to feel that again. I rather be hot and sweaty than feel that pain of being different and looked down yep. upon. It's understood. It's also such a, a moment of clarity that the stories we tell ourselves are much bigger than the actual facts of what it is. And thank mm-hmm. God it was hot. Like it was yeah. a gift because otherwise you might have been still wearing your pants still today. Wearing uh, shorts changed my life. I don't know if I would have met my wife without it. I want to hear about how you met your wife before we go into the running because you seem like you're more on the introverted, shy, focused, driven on whatever interests you. So how did you meet your wife? We were actually hiking out in Utah Mm -hmm. um, in Zion National Park. And there's um, a hike out there called Angel's Landing. It's a relatively dangerous hike. It's only about like one to two feet wide with a thousand foot drop on either side. Oh my, I can't. I'm like, I'm I'm (laughs) nauseous listening. I have a huge fear of height. Like, don't take me hiking anywhere. Oh my. Yeah. I'm the complete opposite. It doesn't even remotely bother me. So I went uh, flying up there in the dark to watch the sunrise. So I had already been up there for like an hour or two or whatever. And I was coming back down. There was a traffic jam of people coming up. There is like a chain link rope that goes through part of it. My wife was like, some lady I didn't know was frozen, holding on to the chain link rope, freaking out. And I was very frustrated. I ran around the outside of her (gasps) on the the side without the chain link with a thousand foot drop. Oh my God, I can't hear um, out. Yeah, I just basically ran around her not holding anything because she was causing a traffic jam of a few people. You know, there's probably five or six people behind her. So I was, you know, a good 10 feet without touching chain link or wall or anything. I cannot breathe. Wait, and, were you just, did you say like, if I die, I die? Or that wasn't I even an option? No, it wasn't even a thought. It was just like, they're annoying me. They're in the way. Do you have control? Um, Wait, I have a very specific, before you go on. <laughs> with, do you have control over your steps? Like when people with feet, you, you can control yeah. every move? Yeah, I think especially because I, I was amputated as a child, my proprioception of the ground is extremely good okay fine okay so it wasn't Uh, like being like really not smart you're just like i'm gonna do this forget it i'm going around them yeah so that was one of my wife's like light bulb moment she's like holy crap the guy with no legs can go right around me on the outside i'm pretty sure i can hike up holding onto a chain link rope Um, were you the only amputee on this yeah yeah we didn't know each other we just coincidentally were hiking the same thing and you and, went, uh, on you went on your own yeah. like okay she was with a group of people i went by myself when she came back down i was uh taking a nap on the landing below i don't even remember we apparently talked and we took a picture together don't remember and she found me on facebook like a week later and i don't accept people on facebook i don't know just it's my my own personal family friend page um, right i was like excuse me do i know you She was like, uh, yeah, we took a picture together in Zion. I was like, are you sure about that? (laughs) <laughs> she, she sent me the picture and I was like oh I guess we did I lived in Boston she lived in New Jersey so we talked online for a few months and then I put up on Facebook who wants to go to Peru to hike the Andes Mountains and she said sure and we went as friends and came back not as friends <laughs> yeah. wow to her you're n- no different than her you just nope. have different legs you're not a person without legs you're with different legs there's no disability nope she's remarkable yeah she's actually a nurse practitioner and she is the amputee liaison in her hospital <laughs> because she of be- you no she was before she met me <laughs> no way yeah this story is bizarre and like yeah. incredible yeah wow. so many crazy coincidences in there wow. Wow, wow, wow. I love this story. By the way, this is why I don't hear stories before I interview people because I love hearing it with my audience. Wow. So how many years do you know your wife? Since 2011. Wow. So right when you got your prosthetic, when you started thinking about running. Uh, we started running together. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, so she's also an athlete. She hasn't been running really since we started having kids, but right, we, did our, we did do our first marathon together. So you meet, you date, long distance you decide to get married at what year we got married in 2014 
2014. When did you start your first marathons? We did it earlier in 2014, in January of 2014, and we got married in July. And what was that first marathon like? Oh, brutal. Brutal. Pain. Yeah. Pain. Yeah, I hadn't really run that much before. I I had never even run like double digit mileage, so to go run 26.2 miles was brutal. <laughs> and what happened the day after? You couldn't move. No, I was fine. We actually we walked around Universal Studios down in Florida. It was a Disney marathon. <laughs> okay, so you you just yeah. the kind of person that just like okay, you're in pain, you get up and you go again. Like you you don't hover over your pain, you don't dwell in your pain. You're like okay, I'm in pain, but life goes on. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is like such an inspiration for me. So you get married. And then what happens next? When when does this real passion of running and you said, okay, I'm going to become a real athlete and I'm going to run races and I'm going to train for them and I'm going to have world records. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we ran that first marathon in 2014 and that was kind of like a bucket list item. I didn't really think much more about running anything serious after that. Like I ran here and there, but nothing crazy. Mm -hmm. And then it was the summer of 2016 when I had been been thinking more about running again but a bunch of us were at the gym and my friends were messing around on the treadmill seeing how fast they could run a mile so I jumped on just like I don't know how fast I can run a mile I've never done anything like this before it was on the treadmill so it's a little bit easier but I ran like a 450 mile mm -hmm. I was like well I guess I'm pretty fast maybe I should see what training would do mm -hmm. um, so I trained for three or four months which was the first time I actually took training seriously for running and I ran the Houston Marathon on in January of 2017. Wow. I had an hour and three minute PR over my first marathon. Wow. That was that was more of an eye opener. It was like, well, if I just did only a few months of training, I had this huge PR. What does like a full year of training give me? So I would say it was really like that late 2016 to early 2017 that I realized that running could be something bigger for me. Do you get the runners high? Do you experience that drive that runners talk about? I think I do, but I feel like it might be different for any everyone. I mean, for me, I'm grateful every single day that I can go out and run because I spent so long thinking I couldn't. So every day I get to put on my running prosthetics and head out that door, head to the treadmill. Mm -hmm. It always makes me smile. So incredible. So what happens after 2017? My third marathon in Chicago of 2017 was, was one where I had trained for quite a bit longer. I had another, uh, I think it was a 21 minute personal record on that one. I didn't have any thoughts going into the race. It was just another race for me. Mm -hmm. And it turned out a few days later that it was, um, an amputee world record, which that one was my first one. Wow. So you went, you didn't go to win anything. You just went to run. No, it was completely unexpected. Wow. Did you have any thought in your mind? I might do very well. Did you even research what the world record for an amputee was? Did you did you nope. know? Oh, you didn't even know. No, I just went and ran a race. And a few days later, I was told it was a world record. I, Actually, wow. I, I think uh, Facebook and Instagram knew before I did because they posted it there before even bothering to tell me. Wow. <laughs> Were you the only amputee there? No, there's usually a bunch in Chicago. Double? I can't even remember, to be honest with you know. now. I'd say Chicago attracts like 10 to 15 amputees every year. So you get this big, you're a celebrity now. I don't know what I thought. It was. I was very shocked more than anything, you know. It, it wasn't even anything that was on my radar. And do you have sponsors running after you the day later? That would be awesome if you know anybody, let me know. <laughs> I'm surprised because you're such an iconic person that like really just shows drive motivation and endurance I, I do have a few great companies that back me but in general it's not like you know some huge nike thing or right. uh, new balance or whatever but i have like three or four amazing companies that um are helping me out that's great so what happened after my time in chicago qualified me to run in the world power championship in london in 2018, mm -hmm. which is the London Marathon. To be selected for that, you know, you're on Team USA and everything. So that was an amazing experience. Team wow. USA sends you all the Team USA gear and wow. you go you go to London, you're treated the same way as any of the other 
major elite athletes. You have, wow. you know, hotel rooms and athlete lounges and massages. It was, right. It right. was just an amazing experience. And again, something that wasn't expected at all. That was um, quite an experience. I was lucky my entire family came with me. So my wife, my kids, my brother, sister, parents. It was, it was fun. A big moment in everybody's yeah. life. Wow. And what happened in that marathon? It was an extremely hot day, and although I got a personal record, it was uh, not the uh, day I was hoping for. It was very hot, and I, it was one of those moments where I let the uh, mental pain beat me. And the pain of running in the heat and running completely by yourself for three hours. So I ran 3.03 there, which was a three-minute personal record, which was great. Um, I won my category for lower limb amputees. I would say overall the day was like a little bit disappointing because I let myself be beat mentally and that bothered me more than anything else. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? What does that mean? Jesse Itzler is my mentor and he talks about a lot when he does 100 mile marathons and he talks about a what you need to get over the mental voices in your head when you run. I'm not an athlete and mm -hmm. I hate running and I, I don't like endurances at all. So explain to me what that is because I don't think it's only for runners. I think it's for anybody in life that has any obstacle or big challenge. What is that mm -hmm. mental block or the voices in your head that you hear that held you back from what you really wanted to achieve that day? Even though what you achieved was greatness. No matter what level of athlete you are, whether whether you're the fastest marathoner in the world or you're the weekend warrior that wants to achieve their, your own personal goal to achieve that goal there's going to be some sort of pain both physically and mentally i would say that i didn't manage to surmount that little voice in my head that was telling me that i i could slow down or i could walk um so in london they they have the para athletes start 50 minutes ahead of the rest of the field Mm -hmm. So I ran the entire marathon completely by myself. There was nobody in front of me. There was nobody behind me. Um, mm -hmm. I ran for three hours completely alone, which in running is, um, it's more of a difficult thing to do, which is why all the runners that go out to set records have what's called pacers with them. So mm -hmm. there's a group of men or women that run with the front runners until they can't run anymore to give them um, the ability to draft behind them. So they block the wind. So I ran completely by myself for three hours. So I had nobody to either lead or follow behind or cheerlead um, you the, the runners wouldn't cheerlead you necessarily there, there but they motivate you like yes, the fact exactly. that there's they motivate because you're a part of a team you see where you are exactly it's, you, you it's see easier others. to run in a pack yes, yes it's easier to run in a pack than it is by yourself so mm -hmm. i would say i let the mental pain of running by myself for three hours tell me that it was okay to slow down or stop there was other factors you know it was hot out and it's mm -hmm. a marathon so there's going to be physical pain to overcome anyways but i would say that that day i'm most disappointed in myself for letting that little mental voice shut me down. What would you rather be the voice in your head? What do you think, like, after you, you were done with the marathon, the fact that I'm hearing that you were disappointed is painful for me to hear because you achieved so much that day. It's sad to me that you think that you didn't do great. What would be your vision of great achievement that day? My goal that race was to be under three hours for the marathon. And I ran 303. So I, I walked through a few of those water stops because I let the little voice in my head say, what does it matter if you walk through these? And if I had just not walked through those two or three water stops, I probably would have been under three hours. There's that saying in running, like you can't ever be disappointed in a personal record, but I can't let it out of my head that for that specific day that I wasn't defeated physically, I was defeated mentally. Are you sure about that? Yeah. Are you sure that physically you could have done it? When do we let voices in our head and our gut be in charge of our body? Because there is a relationship between a voice, a feeling, or just being okay with not being the best. When do we allow ourselves to do that? I try never to let myself uh, <laughs> listen to that voice, but uh, in a marathon distance race, it sometimes happens to me more than at other points in my life. You're very hard on yourself. Maybe that's why you got so far because you overcome those voices and you're like, I'm, I'm bigger than my voices. I'm, I, I, I could do this. And maybe this is why you came so far. Yeah, I have come to expect a lot of myself, not only in athletics, but in every part of life. And that's not too much for 
for you? Do you ever feel like I need a break or you never feel like that? No, I usually just keep plowing forward with whatever needs to be done. And you're okay with everything. That's why you worked 14 hours today and you're talking to me for an hour and you're okay. Yeah. And no, still I, smiling. I, and you have to wake up tomorrow at six o'clock to go to work. And you're 4.30. Have, 4.30. <laughs> oh my goodness. Does your wife mind that you push yourself so much and you don't give yourself a break? Is she afraid that one day you're going to collapse emotionally, physically? I'm sure she worries. She doesn't voice her opinion. She lets you lead your life. I mean, she definitely thinks that I overdo it athletically. What's your next big goal? I'm not really sure because with all the uh, health issues with COVID-19, I don't know if there's going to be any races this year. Are you still training just because you need to train just in case there is? I know that a lot of people were training for Japan and that was like a huge disappointment. Yeah, I was supposed to run the Boston Marathon, which would have been on April 20th. Obviously, that was canceled. So I ran my own marathon on April 19th. I just did a one and a half mile loop around my house 17 and a half times. And how long did that take? Just under three hours. Oh, so you see you did it. Okay. Was it a nice day? It was a beautiful day. The course was much harder than I thought it was. It was actually very hilly. Okay. So I hope you're proud of yourself. I'm sure I really hope you're proud I, of yourself. I, I'm actually very proud of that one. Okay, good. Good. I had to go up I had to go up the same half mile hill seventeen times. So Wow, that's incredible. What's your hope for the next marathon? What do you want to if COVID disappears? Let's say COVID disappears tomorrow and everything is opening. What would be on your calendar? Uh, well, the first time I ever decided I wanted to run a marathon was when I was doing the water stops for the Boston Marathon. And that was back in, I think, 2012, I did those water stops. My big goal is to, obviously, it's a hometown race for me. So my big goal is to go back and run the Boston Marathon. This year, on April 20th, it was supposed to be the uh, first time that they have the para-athletic elite field. Back in 1980, the Boston Marathon was the first people to allow wheelchair racers into races. And now, any of the big world major your marathons you wouldn't consider it a race without the elite wheelchair racers so by boston taking that step and adding that field in is a very historical moment for para athletes in general i was invited to be a part of that elite inaugural field it's been postponed now until september 14th who knows if it's going to happen this year or not if it's something that i should even be doing if they have it depending on what the health issues are we'll see i wouldn't want to bring anything any illnesses back to my own family so it'll be much closer to game time decision on that that one but I definitely do want to go there and run that race at some point it's the first time I said I wanted to run a marathon and it's my hometown race so it's very iconic for me I hope it will be soon and I hope everybody will be healthy then and you'll be able to run and you'll be able to do it under three hours or I don't know what goal who knows what you're gonna set I I hope you're not gonna say under two because I I just don't want to hear that (laughs) and with you now I got to know you for an hour I don't put anything past you just be kind to yourself and be grateful to yourself that you've tried so much and you achieved so much and you don't let the obstacle in your way. I think you owe yourself a tremendous amount of gratitude and huge acknowledgement for what you achieved. Tell me about your children a little bit. I'm going to let you go because it's really late. I just want to hear about your children. How old are they? My son just turned five and I have a daughter that is two and a half. Beautiful. And are they your cheerleaders? Oh yeah. It was awesome having them out there for my neighborhood marathon. They were there 17 loops in a row waving hi. I remember you posted and you took your legs off and you said, literally my feet fell off. And I said, he has a sense of humor with everything that's going on. He has a sense of humor, which was so beautiful to see. Um, One of my... You gotta be able to laugh at yourself. Yes, you have to, right? You have to. And it's such a big lesson in life especially with mental illness bring some humor into it when it's so dark because it could be so dark and don't let the obstacle you said it so beautifully i didn't want my disability to define me exactly you didn't want your disability to define you and i think that with mental illness we so often take our mental illness and say this is who i am and we don't try to overcome it and we accept it versus challenging it and saying we are different it is a disability but we can overcome it and we can try and it's important to try. Really, you taught me a lot about that. What I'm not going to take from you is to be hard on myself. I am very forgiving to myself and I let myself cut corners a lot because I enjoy doing that. I, You know, I noticed that you use the Normatec boots. Oh, yes, I do. I love them. My aunt invented them. Oh, really? Yes. Laura Jacobs. I'm, I'm, I'm Mary Jacobs. She uh-huh. unfortunately passed away from cancer a few years ago. She was like a mother to my husband. 
My husband's mm-hmm. mother left when he was nine. She was the aunt that was the only normal person in the family. And she was like the mother to him in a way. And when mm-hmm. we were dating, he said, I need you to meet my aunt because I'm not going to get married to anybody unless she approves. And she was the one that had to approve of me. And thank God she liked me right away. And <laughs> and I always say the Norma Tech boot was kind of born in our house. We live in Farakwe because she traveled so much near JFK. She was always with her computer inventing this Norma Tech boot. And it was always mm-hmm. like in our house when she was traveling to the Mayo Clinic and we saw the roller coaster. I remember her saying this, I'm going to create a boot that will help circulation. And she had this vision to help people. And I remember being in Boston because they're in Boston, actually. Yeah. Um, I was in Boston. I've been to their headquarters many times. Oh, now. really? My Aunt Laura, if there's a smile big enough in this world, it's hers. She always smiled, always giggled. She was always mm-hmm happy, happy, happy. And her favorite word was, everything is great. Everything is wonderful. (laughs) And you would never know what she was dealing with, with the big world building this incredible machine. And now every athlete uses it. When I saw you wearing it, I'm like, oh, Aunt Laura, you should just know who's wearing your boot and how many (laughs) people she's helping. And it started with a little dream. And I I love that you're from Boston. I just love that. This whole story is so amazing to me. Do you want to leave a legacy in this world for amputees or you just want to be an athlete and you're not giving so much thought and energy or even passion to the amputee world because you don't feel like you're disabled as an amputee? No, I I definitely... Well... It started out as being just driven for me, see how far I could go, but it's definitely morphed into helping pave the way for other amputees. I, because there's so few of us that run or compete at this level, we're writing the book ourselves. There's no guidebook on how to do it, how to overcome all the obstacles of being an amputee and still managing to train and compete at a high level. It's definitely something that has morphed into a passion of helping others. Obviously, my expertise would be an amputee's idea is flowing back and forth between all adaptive athletes about whether you want to be a casual jogger or an elite runner, just how to do what you love to do in a pain-free way, basically live life without limitations. It's definitely morphed into that. And I'm lucky that I have a platform where I can reach other adaptive athletes in general. And a lot of them do reach out to me on Instagram. And I try my best to either provide them with what I know or connect them with the people that do, but I definitely think that it's um, an area where there needs to be more voice and more connection with people, whether it's how to overcome issues or even just how to get the running prosthetics or adaptive equipment in general. Or even how to walk again or not to be... How, yeah, like I like said, an, at any any yeah, level. Right, right, at any uh, level, because it's mm-hmm. painful. Do you know Mona Patel? No. She actually won an award. I, I think it was a Hero Award on CNN. She's an amputee, and she started this nonprofit in Texas, and she also she has a goal of climbing the the highest mountains in the world or something like that. She's like yeah, incredible. Seven summits. Yeah, some, something like that. So she did 29029. Do you know what that is? It's climbing a mountain like Everest, but you climb it a few times on the same incline of Everest. And she did it as an amputee. Like it's mind boggling. Mm-hmm. And she has this nonprofit for amputees and it's amazing what she's doing. But she just shows that you could just, don't be a victim put your prosthetic on and start moving and be Mm -hmm. okay and fit in and live your life. Just like you said, live your life because you can. And it's an inspiration. She is one of the most inspiring people I know. You're right there with her because I get so inspired seeing people that have all the right in the world to say, I'm done. Bring me my soup. Bring me my milkshakes. Come visit me and I'll be in bed. They get up and they're not victims and they just inspire the world. And not only that, like what you're doing, you're helping others to get up and walk and do and live their life, whatever it is, whatever their dream is. Don't stop your dream when you become an amputee, God forbid. And it's really admirable. And I am so grateful 
to you for sharing your story and for inspiring me. Every time you post, I have a smile on my face. Every single time you post, I smile. And I'm like, Thank wow. You. And you inspire me. I have little obstacles in my life. They're just a regular, you know? And as a mom, I have five children. I run two businesses. Ooh, that's, a, that's a lot. <laughs> My sister has 11. My wow. Sister, my sister has 11 and she's a CEO of the largest nonprofit in Israel for women, female entrepreneurs. So yeah, she's 11 children. She flies that is a lot. So I feel like five is like nothing compared to her, but it, it's a lot. And I barely so, get by with two. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot, but it's not even about the children. It's about our passions, about life. It's evolving with life. It's relationships. It's so many things. And and you're just an inspiration. And, and I hope my audience takes from this that when you see an obstacle in your journey, whatever it is, don't tell yourself that you cannot overcome it. Try, research, take the pants off, just like Brian. Take, <laughs> and try it out. Try it out. You might, it might be your road to freedom. It might I'm going to use that as my phrase from now on. Take the pants <laughs> off. <laughs> no, really. Take the pants off. It might be your road to freedom. Just like you said, it was your second feeling of the biggest freedom of your life. But for so many years, you were holding your body behind that because you were afraid. And if you would know how easy it was, you would do it 15 years before. Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's for me, that's the biggest takeaway of this story, besides the fact that you're incredible. And another thing, don't be hard on yourself like Brian. <laughs> Run that marathon and be okay that you just ran that marathon. Don't be hard on yourself. That's the thing yeah. that don't take away <laughs> that that point because I'm I'm not into that because I feel like people do fall apart after that and we have to love ourselves and forgive ourselves for disappointments and you you disappointed yourself and just be okay with it. I want to ask you what does hope mean to you? Oh man, that's a tough one. You saved it to the end. You could take a minute to think. In what context? Anything in life. So what does hope mean to you? Do you live with hope? Do you ever feel hopeless? No, no, not really. I mean, no. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say never, but I don't know. I guess I'm good at like just dealing with each day as it comes. So maybe, maybe, um, maybe to you, it's really de taking a moment at a time, being present. I'm not good at that. So. so you could think about it overnight. I'm actually in awe that somebody can say that they don't really need hope because they don't really have an, like something that they feel so hopeless. Maybe you learn to just be okay with whatever's going on. I would say so. I, I just, it takes a lot to stress me out past like the very present moment. Like everybody's stressed about COVID-19, but it's just another day for me. Not that I don't take the precautions. Right. Necessary, of course, between right. masking and washing and social distancing, but like it doesn't cause a feeling of hopelessness in me or anything like that. That's amazing. I don't know. I'm, just, I'm good with rolling with the punches, I guess. <laughs> okay. So maybe hope for you is rolling with the punches. Maybe. Think about it and you can always you can always uh, email me if you have a, um, a thought or maybe ask your wife what she thinks hope means to you. Maybe she can help you with that. She's good at that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. So you can you can ask her. What is your profession that you work so many hours a day? I work in a running store called the Sneaker Factory. We're one of the oldest running stores in the country, 42 years old. And the second job I just started this week is with a company called Athletic Brewing. They're mm -hmm. um, a non-alcoholic beer company based in Stratford, Connecticut. You travel to Connecticut? No, I'm, I do the uh, sales managing for the New Jersey and a few counties in New York. Very different jobs. And your wife is in the medical industry. So you really, yeah. you guys really work hard, really, really hard. Amazing. Yeah, I, she is an amazingly hard worker. Well, I'll let you go because you have to wake up in a few hours. Thank you so much for sharing your story, for inspiring us, for showing us what it's like to put one foot in front of the other, even if you don't have feet. So get new feet. <laughs> just get new feet. You don't have feet, just get new feet. For really inspiring everyone to, to take life lightly never put anything past yourself and take your pants off <laughs> in a um, non-sexual way i think you thank should you all me on the show. yeah thank you and check brian out what is your instagram account brian reynolds runner brian reynolds runner it'll be in the show notes and if anybody wants to sponsor him you know how to find him now and a great opportunity thank you brian keep well keep safe and i want to hear when you're in the boston marathon i want to hear about that and hopefully it'll be happen soon and everything with covid will disappear and we'll be able to be up and running in marathons what an inspiration 
inspiration. Thank you for listening. We highly appreciate all of our listeners. And Mental Health Together is better. You being here means a tremendous amount to us. If you enjoyed this episode and you would like some extra boost of information and inspiration that is not on the podcast, you can go to our website, hopetorecharge.com. There's some premium content that for the cost of a cup of coffee, you can download some amazing information that will help you, a tool that will guide you through life. So don't skip a beat. Don't hesitate. Go to hopetorecharge.com. Thank you for joining us. And remember, if you enjoyed this and you want to say thank you, the best way of gratitude will be by you leaving a review or a comment or sharing this with a loved one. There is no greater form of gratitude for us. Thank you. Thank you.